Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today we're going to be finishing up the top 100 board games of all time, 2022 edition, numbers 10 through 1. These are the best of the best, all 10 rated games, which means they are outstanding games that I always want to play and I never see that changing. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It's the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for your continuous support. Couldn't be here without you. Before we get started with the list, I do want to mention three games that barely missed it. Now these games are good enough to be on this list, but they just missed it because of timing. I played them after I had already started and the list was set in stone by them. The first game here is Vagrant Song. This is a super approachable boss battling game with an amazing theme of roaming around a train, tackling bosses, and using a very interesting coin system where you're going to be programming your actions, as well as a bindle bag system where you're pulling tokens for items, as well as activating the enemy's actions. I really love the interesting scenarios this one pulls out and how accessible and approachable it is, but how great the story and writing is as well. The next game I want to talk about is El Grande. This is an area control game that features some very simplified systems, but does so in a very compelling way. It pairs your order as well as how many troops you put on the map with these ability cards, and I just think this makes for extremely exciting and tense gameplay, and it has this great Castillo mechanism where you're going to be shooting out these troops at the end and right before the scoring phases, and it just makes so many interesting tense moments. I really like how this one plays out. And the last game here is a two-player only game, ka -ching. This is a game right game that is too good for what it is where you have all this information that's public at the beginning and a seven wonders dual style where cards are on top of each other and you can only take the cards that are at the top and revealed currently but on your turn you just have two choices to either take a card or sell cards in your hand and I love this decision here you may have to pick up things or you may sell things just to make sure that you can kind of pass a turn amazing choices in such a short time frame with such a small rule set incredible game this is ka -ching. And those are the honorable mentions. Let's get started with the list. My number 10 goes to Bullet Heart, a game where you play as heroines using your pattern cards to destroy these bullets that are coming down towards you. And the game features asymmetry on several levels, where each character is going to have their own effect, their own actions, and their own pattern cards. And it's going to be up to you to use your actions to move things around to match those pattern cards. And in tandem with your ability, clear them and send them to the opponent or to the boss if you're playing that mode. Some of my favorite things in this game are the real-time nature of the multiplayer games, where you have this timer that's pressuring you to make quick, snappy decisions, and how there's a lot of risk management that's put into those decisions. You're going to have to be clever with how you use your effects and move things around, and it's going to change the way that you approach this style of game. It's a puzzle game, but also has some risk management and push-your-luck involved. I also really enjoy the asymmetry of the characters. Not only are the abilities different, but the boards, and some even have special pieces that will go on their boards. And the last thing I want to mention is how strong the various game modes are. The competitive version has you playing a Tetris attack style, where you're sending your cleared bullets to your opponents, and you're pushing your luck to try to see how many you can send, and how much you can set up for future rounds. I really love this system. And then the co-op and solo modes have you taking on the bosses, or competing in a score attack. But the bosses here are really what makes things interesting. They have their own shields that you'll need to send bullets to clear, effects that will change how you play and how you approach things, and new patterns that you'll have to restructure while retaining the asymmetric feature of the heroines in the competitive mode. This is such an incredible experience. If you like real time, if you don't like real time, there are different ways that you can play it by turning that off. So it makes it a way that's accessible and approachable and something that you're going to want to play with a variety of groups. I love Bullet Heart and I think that this design team is incredible with the way that they're able to change things up, plug in this asymmetry and get you excited to keep on pulling out bullets. Love this game. That is my number 10. My number nine goes to Capital X2 Generations. Now this was originally shown to me by my friend Tia over at Takaijo, but it's an abstracted area control game that is all card driven. On your turn, you have a choice of either playing to this main capital area, getting a special effect, or playing to your home base for points. At the end of the round, and there are three, you'll compare your home base to the numbers in the center. If you have not gone past that limit in the capital, you keep all of your cards. And if you make it to the very end, the cards in front of you are points. However, if you have too many, more than what's in the center here, then you're going to lose all those cards. If you win the majorities, though, in these areas, you take one of these cards as a bonus additional points that cannot be removed at the end, so there's some incentive to reaching just at that tipping point. I love this system, and the gameplay itself is extremely enticing and exciting because every turn is so simple, 
but your decisions are extremely impactful for not just you, but every other player at the table. And my favorite parts about this game include the drafting at the start of each round. I love that you have a hand of six cards and you're picking two at a time and picking how your dominoes are going to fall for these short rounds. You can add cards to your hand during the rounds, but generally those six are going to be your core strategy. And to make this drafting even more intense, the abilities of your cards are going to change based on these variable tiles that populate the capital. Every time you start the game, you'll take four of these tiles for each of the different colors, put them out, and that determines the effects of the cards when you play them in the capital. So you're not getting points, but you're getting some effect, and I love that choice here. Do you help everybody at the table, or do you be selfish, play it in front of you, and get those points instead? I love this system, and it just works extremely well. The last thing I really enjoy is the hand management. At the end of every round, once somebody plays a card, they trigger the end, and if you have anything remaining in your hand, you have to play it in front of you after you take a single extra turn. I love this system because you're playing these odds, you're thinking about what you're going to be holding and what you're going to get to play for free, and so you know, okay, I don't need to waste actions playing this, or maybe I play this on my turn just to kind of pass because I already know I want to keep it in front of me. There's some great choices in the cards that not only you play, but the cards that you don't play. And lastly, the variability in this game is top notch. There are so many different modules, so many different expansions, but it retains that core experience of that tense decision making. And I think this just sings. The incredible experience for this area control style. I love the card play. I love the choices. Capital X Two Generations, incredible game, my number nine. Now the last two games on this list were brand new to it, but Super Fantasy Brawl here has risen from 49 all the way to eight. It has become my two player competitive game that I always want to play. Super Fantasy Brawl has you taking three champions, combining those champions' cards into a single deck, and then drawing a hand of five, and using those five cards to maneuver these champions around the map. You are either trying to take out your enemy's pieces to gain trophies, or trying to satisfy objectives to gain trophies in a more efficient manner. And I love this system. That's really the core of it. You're taking your champions, you're maneuvering, taking only about three actions a turn, and then trying to position yourself to score multiple objective criteria while also trying to defeat your opponents. It's more than just the killing of the opponent, but also how you intertwine the objectives into your gameplay. Super Fantasy Brawl offers purposeful combat as well as purposeful positioning through the objective card system, because they're just more advantageous than going and knocking out your opponents, but that's still a very important factor of the game. When you look at the objectives, they're easy to understand, and they work with all of the different facets of the game, and I really love this, because you can tell what you need to do and what you need to do to stop your opponent from doing them as well. In addition to the objective system, I really love the cards and the decks and how they're constructed. Each champion comes with six cards, you'll shuffle them, two of each color with all of the other champions cards and so you have a deck of 18. You get to know this deck over your course of play because you're drawing five using three of those cards usually to do actions then discarding the rest of your hand and drawing more. There are ways that you can plan and place cards on top of your deck and strategize and push your luck trying to anticipate what activations maybe your opponent may or may not be able to activate being able to make interesting plays based on these choices. I really love this system and the cards themselves are so clean so interesting and I love the way that they read. For example, this blizzard effect here, you move two, you attack something next to you, you deal two damage, and then after the attack, you do this effect. It is so easy to read. You go down the line, and they're so thematic. Some of my favorite cards exist in this game. There's one that's a throw card where you literally move, choose somebody next to you, and then toss them across the ring. So thematic, so easy to read, and I love this system. Every card is unique to these champions as well, so you're going to get some really interesting variety, and maybe you're hoping for specific cards as you shuffle up the deck. Super Fantasy Brawl also boasts a very cool draft system if you get to know the characters a lot, so you can pick your teams in a very interesting way, and it also just has a relatively short playtime, so it's going to be one that you're going to end up pulling out quite a bit. So that is my number eight, Super Fantasy Brawl. My number seven goes to Biblios. My number nine last year, this is a game of monks and manuscripts where you're going to be gathering all of these books for your monastery and doing so through an auctioning system as well as a push your luck mechanism. Now Biblios features two distinct halves of the game. In the first half, you have a push your luck system, which is one of my favorite parts. You'll have this large deck of cards where when it's your turn, you'll reveal the top and you decide right then and there if you want to keep this card, put it into an auction pile or put it face up for all of your opponents to take. I love 
love this choice, and I love how you are pushing your luck in every single card draw whenever you decide where to place it. So after you've done those things, all the other players will take those cards that have been revealed, add them to their personal hands, and then have that same choice. Once the deck is depleted, you'll take that auction stack, and then using any of the money cards that you've collected, you're able to actually auction for the cards in that bid pile. If it's a card that is not money, you bid money for it, but if it's money, you just bid cards in your hand, which leads into some other aspects I really enjoy. The first is the auction pile itself. I love that you can store cards in there that maybe you want, or you can dilute the deck with cards you may think are unimportant. There's some great choice in what you put in that pile and what you keep for yourself. I also really enjoy the unrestrictive nature of the auctioning style. When you're bidding for these money cards, you can bid any card in your hand, including other money cards, which means you could be pretty aggressive in your auctioning. And on top of that, when you auction for things, you can bid more than you actually have. However, if you're caught, there is a big penalty for doing so. You're going to lose a lot of cards in your hand, and then the auction will restart. This is such a cool mechanism because all the people at the table have to really think about what people are auctioning and if they're actually committed and actually able to do this. And going back to that first part of the game, I really love the way that the information is trickled out through the push your luck system. Every card that somebody puts face up gives you information as to what the players around the table have, but what's more important is the cards that people are keeping. You know that they've chosen not to take those other two things, so maybe they took something they deemed extremely important, or maybe they're not going for those specific cards. Another thing I love is the scoring itself. In the center of the table, there'll be this board that has five different colored dice that all start at the number three. This is how many points each of the majorities are. If I have the most red cards at the end here, I'm going to take that red three and I get three points. That is how you win. These are the only way that you generate points. But during the game, you can actually take cards that will manipulate these values. You're actually losing value when it comes to the cards in your hand and that hand management and actually winning the majorities, but you're bumping up or pushing down the different values on the dice. And I love this system. I love that it's going to incentivize you to pursue different colors. And based on when these pluses and minuses come out during the game, Game, you may have to plus or minus something with no information or no cards in your hand. So right off the bat, you're going to incentivize plays for specific colors. And I love this. There's so many interesting things that can happen, whether those pluses go into the auction pile, or if you draw one from the top, you may pick it instead of actually going for a value. I love the dynamic nature of the scoring, and I think it's so elegant in the way that they use the dice to do so. Biblios is a filler game that offers tense decisions, incredible strategy, push your luck all in one pack. I love this game. That's Biblios, my number seven. My number six, number seven last year, is Brass Birmingham, a game where you play as industrialists doing your best to create these different networks as well as sell a variety of goods to a variety of markets. To understand my love of brass, you're going to need to know how the different pieces interact and work. For example, you have these network pieces here that will connect city to city and allow different goods to travel through them. You also have the goods tiles, which you're trying to sell to these cities, and you'll do that by connecting them through roads or through your opponent's roads. So the networks connect to these large tiles, and you're going to be building these using these resource tiles. So for example, you have iron here, and there's also coal. And the last thing you're going to try to do is actually sell the tiles, and you'll do so by flipping them, but you need to make sure there are beer to flip them. So the resources allow you to play the tiles, the different roads connect the tiles, and then the beer allows you to actually sell the tiles. So this is the cycle that exists in Brass, but the core concept of this game is the opportunism that interacts between them all. In Brass, everyone can pretty much use everybody's resources, especially if there's a connection between them. For example, if you create beer and iron, when it gets to my turn and that's still there, I can use those to sell a tile, which is extremely beneficial to me because now I no longer have to take the time to build and network and create that beer because I've just used yours. Yes, your tile is going to flip and you're going to get some points, but I'm allowed to develop my strategy even further because of the opportunity you gave me. And that trickles to pretty much every single portion of this game. If you build a network somewhere, all of a sudden someone else can take something on their action. If you create iron on the board, you've suddenly made it cheaper for someone to perform an action that requires it. There's a lot of tactical play and pivoting and trying to prioritize when you want to build things, and especially when you want to build things that you actively want to use because you're afraid and terrified of what other players may do with it. Knowing from turn one the mooching that's going to happen is going to push you to be more thoughtful with your play throughout the entire experience. Another thing I really love about Brass is the hand management and card action system. Every time you take an action, you're going to have to play a card, and you'll be doing two at a time, so you'll refill back up afterwards. Once you get down to your last eight cards, that's it. So you have to be very careful with this hand you're curating. 
cool twist on this is only one action actually cares about the symbols on the cards. So it's very important that you cater your hand so that when you do take that action, the build action, you actually have the options you want. And I really love this because building is so important that you want to keep your options open. There's two different cards. You have these symbol cards that allow you to build in places where you already have pieces or are connected to your pieces. You could build that exact type. So a lot of flexibility with the different locations. Or you have city cards where you can build anything that's already available in that city. So I really love this system here and the choice and how you are narrowing down your options throughout the course of the round and you're catering towards those progressive future build actions and how important it is to make sure you do so. Brass has so many great choices when it comes to the opportunism, the card play, your choice, and then the timing of everything. And it's wrapped nicely in this extremely clean action system with the two actions per turn. I love how you're constantly developing your own industry and moving out onto the board. Brass Birmingham is a tremendous feat when it comes to card play, engine building. Love this game. That is my number six. My number five, number five last year is Too Many Bones, where you play as Gearlocks in the land of Daylor, going after a tyrant, attacking them, defeating their minions, and hopefully saving the day. One of my favorite things in Too Many Bones is the flavor of the world itself. I love how unique the different characters are, the scenarios that you'll be reading through, the events, the creatures, the baddies, the tyrants, the backstories. Every single detail in this world is fully fleshed out, and it's going to be one that you want to explore. In addition to that, the characters themselves are absolutely wonderful. I love how each of them comes with a reference sheet that's going to explain how they work, how they operate, and offer you a new puzzle to explore. But each character has multiple facets to them. And this leads into another thing I love about the Gearlocks are their tech trees in the form of their skill abilities. Whenever you level up a Gearlock, you can use their training points to increase their core stats, or you can start working on their tech trees. For example, you have Boomer here who has these four different colors that you can start working on. And once you develop one, you may want to further go down that path to unlock stronger effects. But it's all up to you. You have the player choice and player agency on the different skills you pursue. So each gameplay is going to be drastically different based on the different character you choose as well as the different paths you decide to go down. It could be based on the boss or the different minions you'll be fighting or the different characters that exist in your party, what role that you decide to play this time, or just what abilities that you think sound the most fun. I love the choice in the tech trees and I love that you're able to use those skills pretty much in instantly once you pick them up. In addition, I love the actual gameplay and combat of the encounters themselves. You'll be playing on this tiny 4x4 map where your characters will move around, use their effects, take down baddies, and then repopulate the board of the baddies until you've defeated them all. These fights are tense, strategic, tactical, but also extremely fun and rewarding. You'll be using all of the resources available to you because winning these battles is pretty important. You get skill abilities, you get new treasures, and this game incentivizes you to use what you have, and I love that about this game. I love the item system and how you're going to be using them to interact from fight to fight and you're not just saving them all for the boss fight because you do get them so frequently. There's a lot to love here with the tactical choices and I love how straightforward the combat is with the way that the characters move and interact. The initiative order is clean and it makes sense and the turn structure itself is extremely straightforward with moving, picking your target, then rolling the dice. And to top it all off, the scenario and encounter structure of the game as a whole is extremely enticing and it's going to make you want to play this game game over and over again. You start with a tyrant, and that tyrant is who you're going after. They have a time limit, so you can pick how long you actually want to play the game, and then you'll create an event deck based on that time limit. You'll go from card after card, either doing a small event or actually participating in one of these battles and building up your character throughout this process. And then finally, you'll reach enough points to actually fight this main boss, and when you defeat them, you've won your game. I love how this structure is set up. It's going to get you in there, playing, leveling up your characters, and experiencing all that Too Many Bones has to offer. The flavor of Too Many Bones, the tech trees, the encounters, the baddies, the loot systems, the world of day lore. I love Too Many Bones, and I want to go on an adventure right now. That's my number five, Too Many Bones. My number four goes to Hollertow, a game where you play as farmers, doing your best to improve your workshops through the use of a variety of small systems, including crop rotation, a very unique worker placement system, and then objective-driven cards. The first thing I want to talk about are those workshops. The whole purpose of this game is 
is to develop your workshops by paying a different amount of resources. And I just love the resources that exist in this game. You have all of your crops that can be planted in these fields. And the way that the farming works is really interesting. At the end of the round, wherever they're planted, that number is going to determine how many of that crop you get. But the more you use a field, the worse it becomes. It becomes less fertile, which is really interesting. And if you don't use a field, it actually increases. So this is that crop rotation. I really love this system, and it makes grabbing the crops an interesting puzzle in itself. In addition to the crops, there are a variety of other goods that you'll need to gather. And you can do this through the innovative worker placement system. As you can see on this board here, there are these universal cubes that every player gets as their workers. When you send a worker out onto the board, you perform the action. However, if there's already a worker there, you just put more than was there previously. So if there's one, you need to put two. If there are one and then two already filled, you'll need to put in three. Once everything is fulled up, like this one up here, you can't use that space anymore. And I think this is such a cool system. It's going to prioritize you to go after specific actions, maybe just because they're cheap, or maybe you do spend that extra resource in the form of your workers to take a very important critical action. There are so many excellent small pieces that form Hollertau's system, but the one uniting feature between all of them is the card play, and that's my favorite part of the entire game. At the start of the game, you're going to have four different decks that are all separate, each providing a different thing. One for endgame scoring, one with production, and then two that give you specific objectives that you're trying to complete for a powerful effect and leading into those other cards. For example, here you have these gateway cards that are going to give you some goal that you have to do, but when you do, you'll get a production card in return as well as an instant effect. I love this cascading system of objectives because it's going to guide how you play and how you interact with all of the other systems that exist in Hollow Tower as a whole. I love the small choices, I love how you can chain cards, and I love how you have to prioritize different things with the cards that are present at that turn one. You have some great decisions when it comes when to achieve these bonuses, and my favorite part about these cards are that you can use them at any time. You can gain income, then immediately use some of the things that you got to play a card, which will give you something else. You can produce with your sheep, and then immediately get rid of one of those sheeps to satisfy the condition for another card. I love just how you have so much freedom in these cards, but it's up to you when you want to play them to be most beneficial. There's some great decisions here, and I love that even the card decks are going to be different each time, because I think there are 10 different card decks for the Gateway and the Cowboy Hat cards, and you'll be consistently adding them to your hand throughout the course of the game, and there are even spaces on the board where you can add even more to your hand. The card system of this game takes all the other things I love, the resources, the farming, etc., and makes it into a package that I just always want to play. I get to look at my hand of cards and see how I'm going to farm this time. I love Hollow Tau, my number four. My number three, number four last year, goes to Maracaibo, a game where you play as the captain of a ship in the Caribbean, doing your best to gain influence and fame throughout the area while also interacting with a variety of spots on the board and building your engine in a variety of different ways. My favorite part about Maracaibo are the multi-use cards. You can use them for their good symbol here on the left or their quest symbol on the bottom when interacting with other card effects, or you can play them for their abilities in front of you into your own personal tableau. Maracaibo is a game where every single card you kind of want to play you look at it and say wow this could be a really cool effect and this is just exacerbated because you can actually find a card on your first turn and say wow i want to rotate my entire game around this specific card and you can do that the game allows you to it has a reservation system where if there's a card you really want to play put it there and you will get to play it i love this system and i love how it's all up to you on which path that you choose from that turn one in addition there's some amazing creativity with these cards when it comes to these assistants here these blue icons you'll actually be placing pieces onto the board and they become pieces that you can visit throughout your game. A new action space that's only available to you and you do whatever the card says. This allows you some flexibility with your play but also has you prioritizing taking time to go visit this person. I love this choice and how it's up to the player to pursue this. There are also synergies that exist with the cards, but they're flexible in how they're done through the use of synergy tokens. For example, if I play this harbor here, it generates a harbor token, but there are many other ways to gain these harbor tokens. I really like that there's some choice in the different cards you play to gain these different synergy tokens. And once you get one, for example, say I get this craftsman token, it'll retroactively give abilities to all the other cards you play. So now that I have this craftsman icon, my harbor here is going to give me some extra points at the end of every round. This is such a great system and I love how it gives you the choice on how you want to pursue the different synergies that exist in the game. The cards are incredible, but the turn flow and pacing is also top notch. I love that when you visit cities you're also able to upgrade your ships. Every time you remove two discs you get a permanent effect that you'll have for the rest of the game or some instant bonus that you may need at a certain clutch moment. I love the choice when it comes to upgrading your ship and how satisfying it is to deliver, upgrade, and take the action of the cities you visit. The escalation of 
of the game is also amazing as you'll be playing more cards, getting more incomes, more abilities, and able to choose from a lot of different options when it comes to sailing throughout the Caribbean. The last thing that I would have mentioned is the campaign system as a whole. This is going to introduce a deck of cards that have story options. It'll populate the board with special tiles, special effects, and then it's up to you as the players to decide if you want to pursue these things. You don't have to play with the same group. This is just a persistent world that the game is. And I love this. I love how the game evolves based on the player choice. I love how the narrative will provide different options for players to go after or completely ignore. It's up to you, and I love the decision making here. Maracaibo offers incredible card play, flexible synergies, an upgrade system and turn flow that I love, and a persistent world in the form of a narrative incredible game. That is my number three, Maracaibo. My number two, number three last year is Blood Rage, a game where you play as Viking clans doing your best to gain glory and honor during Ragnarok. The world is ending, so how will you impress the Norse gods? Blood Rage at its heart is a card drafting game. At the start of each round, you'll have a God's Gift phase, where you'll be taking cards from a large pool, drafting one at a time until you have six. And based on those cards that you pick, you're going to be getting new powers, abilities, special effects that are only accessible to you. I love this phase of the game, and it's one of my favorite parts because you are planning what you're going to do for the entire round during this phase and with these six cards. These are limited, so you have some tough choices when it comes to these, and pretty much every card in this game has a purpose. These are cards that you want to play. You want all of them, so the choice just becomes even more difficult every time you get one. I love this system here, and I love the God's Gift phase. I love that it's up to you on what you want to choose when it comes to your powers, abilities, and objectives. Now that we've drafted the cards for the round, you'll have to do your best to use them efficiently in the action phase. On your turn, you only get one action, and you have a lot of choices. The first thing you do are play your cards, either those objectives, or you can play your upgrades in front of you. You can summon your units to the board. You can move your existing units or you can initiate a pillage, which is fighting and trying to gain the reward from the spaces on the board. This action system is so critical to what makes Blood Rage so good because it gives you so much agency on your turn. You could do any of these things, but that tension and the timing of oh, you only get to do one. I love this system and it makes every single choice you make so important and critical. Do you summon a character on the board to start holding a position and set up for a pillage later? Do you upgrade your personal space so that you get more advantages from actually doing things later in the game? Or do you commit quest cards so you don't potentially lose them in future conflicts? There's so many different choices and so many things that you have to be considering, not just your own personal strategies, but what everyone else is doing on the main game board. The board in Blood Rage invites players to create a plan during that drafting phase and then implement said plan in the actual action phase. And one thing that really facilitates facilitates this is the way that combat is performed. The combat in Blood Rage is effective, straightforward, and glorious. On your turn, if you have a character in an area that hasn't been pillaged yet, you pillage, and then everybody at the table has the opportunity clockwise to join the fight. So if you want to fight, you are going to get the opportunity. I love that this increases the potential of positioning, because not only are you staying where you are for potential control at the end of the round, but you also have to keep in mind this joining effect and being able to jump into other battles. Are you going somewhere to position yourself for the future, or just for some flexibility in joining battles right now? I love this decision, this choice, and how it's up to the players on how they want to interact when a battle is initiated. And then the battle starts. All players who are participating have to take a card from their hand and put it face down as a battle card. Then you'll reveal the number. Whoever has the highest strength after these cards have been revealed, you'll compare the strength of your units plus the cards that you play, wins the battle. If you started the pillage, you get the reward, and then everyone else is defeated and sent to Valhalla. But have no fear, those characters in Valhalla will return, and they'll be back next round. I love this system. I love how straightforward and simple it is. And if it's a tie, everyone loses. If you lose the battle, you get those cards back that you played, but if you won, you discard. And I love this system, because if you are steamrolling these battles, you potentially may lose some cards that you wanted to play later in the round. So it adds some more tension with your turns. Do I play this card now and make sure that it gets played in front of me, whether it be one of those quest objectives or an upgrade, or do I need to attack right now just to make sure that I get this victory on the board? It's up to you as the player to decide what's more important at what time. I love this battle system, and I think that it just permeates every other aspect of this game, but it's something that you can manipulate and control. There are some battles you may want to win, some you may want to lose. 
There are some you may not even want to start because of the implications and how it can affect the board state and all of your other ideas and strategies. Blood Rage's action system, card system, battle system, powers and abilities are so magnificent. This is my favorite multiplayer experience. Blood Rage, my number two game of all time. My number one, number one last year, goes to Marvel Champions. When I said that Blood Rage was my favorite multiplayer game, I meant it. But with Marvel Champions, I don't need anyone. I play this game all the time. Marvel Champions has you playing as a superhero, using your abilities, your powers, your allies, and all of your equipment at your disposal to take down a villain of your choosing. This villain is trying to complete their own scheme or take you out. Every turn of Marvel Champions is a puzzle. You'll have a hand of cards, and each card has a resource cost to actually play it, and then the resources that that card provides. And you have to decide which cards you will use to pay for others. You have some choices when it comes to bringing out cards for forms of engine building, or having to deal with the immediate threat that exists on the board based on the villain that you're fighting. This choice is integral into how your gameplay of Marvel Champions is going to develop. Now, in addition, once you start getting these cards out and these assets and upgrades and events, you'll have all sorts of different powers and abilities that you can use. One of my favorite characters, Iron Man, really exemplifies this. So he has all sorts of abilities and knobs that he gets to turn when he develops his own personal engine in the form of his suit. He's a character that escalates in power as the scenarios grow, and it's just such a gratifying feeling to balance between the immediate threat and the engine building that progresses throughout the game. In addition to the incredible mechanisms, the thematics are on point. If I want to be a specific character, I can be that character. If I want to delve into the chaos magic, I could become Wanda Maximoff. If I want to be the almighty Thor, I gotta give a shout out to my favorite here, I can be calling out minions to fight and then shooting them back into Valhalla. There's amazing things to do in Marvel Champions, and the design team that has brought the creativity to the cards is top notch. Another huge strength of this game is its approachability. When you want to play a game of Marvel Champions, you'll choose a hero, take their 15 hero cards, and pair them with an aspect. And this gives you a lot of variety with being able to go down different paths and different playstyles. You have aggression, which is obviously more aggressive and more damage focused. You have protection that gives you a lot of healing, health, defense. Then you have teamwork and justice, which will allow you to control forts and control a team of heroes with a bunch of allies. I love that you're going to have lots of different combinations and different playstyles with each character based on the aspect you choose. After you pair up those two choices, you'll choose a villain that you want to go after in the form of a scenario, and these scenarios offer you some different gameplay. Whether it be the Green Goblin who's trying to turn the entire city into mutants, or if it's Kang the Conqueror who's trying to defeat the heroes through all manners of time and space. There are so many different combinations with how you decide to set up the game, and it's entirely up to the player, not only the characters they pick, but the villains they pick, and the difficulty at which you experience this. With the addition of the Red Hood scenario pack, there are now even more advanced difficulties that you can play in, which make even the strongest characters have challenges that they can face. This game is meant to be enjoyed, played, discovered. It's a game that you can spend so many hours in, and I do. I think this game is absolutely wonderful, and whenever a new pack comes out, I always think to myself, I gotta play this right now, and I do, and it's awesome. I sleeve it up, I get it going, I don't care how late I have to stay up, I am trying out these new mechanisms and mechanics, and I cannot wait to see the creativity that comes into these cards. So the puzzle turn, the immediate threat versus the engine building, powers and abilities, all those knobs you get to turn, the deck construction, the scenario gameplay, the approachability, and your hero fighting the villain, Marvel Champions is my number one game of all time. And that's the list. Those are my top 100 board games of all time. And this has been number 10 through one, the 2022 edition. Thank you so much to all of you who have subscribed and have joined me on this journey and seen this top 100 from start to finish. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the support. I could not be here without you. What do you think of the list? What did you think about the choices overall? Are there any games that you agree with? Were you surprised by anything here? Anything that you were surprised didn't show up on the top 100 at all? Anything that you think should have been lower or higher, I'd just love to hear what you think about these games in general. Thank you so much for watching Side Game Strong.